Today we're going to be analyzing the issue of Shema, the three paragraphs of the Shema. What were Chazal doing when they enveloped or they sandwiched the Shema in with its brachos? They expanded it. We're going to see how they expanded each and every paragraph of the Shema. And a more basic question that we have to ask is, why did the rabbi set up Shema as the immediate prelude to the Amidah? I mean, when you look at Shema, there's a basic question you ask. Shema is a philosophical statement. The three paragraphs, what are they? Let's, let's go through the three paragraphs. The first is a universal statement about our existence, that God is the source of all existence. Ha-Yehovah-Vi-Ya, what is the yud ke vav the ineffable name? He's a source, he has been, he is, he will be, he is the source of all existence. Elokeinu, he is our God, he runs this universe. And Hashem Echad, he's a complete unity. He is one, he's unique, he is distinct, yachid, but he's one, There's a, he's a complete unity. So it's a, it's a statement that every human being, you know, in terms of living on this earth has to know. Second paragraph is not a universal statement about the nature of God and, and our, as being created and sustained by God, our relationship with God. The second paragraph is, is very parochial. It's unique to the Jewish people. We have this specific, unique, distinct covenant known as Torah and mitzvot, and we always say, what's Torah? That's the theory, it's the principles, the various axioms and postulates, and the mitzvot are the applications of those principles, how we conduct ourselves based upon those values. So we have that system. What makes that unique, parochial, distinct? There's a covenant, the covenant that took us out of the realm of being B'nai Noach, you know, regular ethical monotheistic human beings to becoming B'nai Yisrael, speci specific unique covenant. And that's, that goes from the, not just quantitatively from 7 to 613, but qualitatively, it's a different relationship. We're under specific providence. As a nation, we're under specific providence. So what's the first paragraph? Relating to God as a human being. Second paragraph, relating to God as a Jew. What's the third paragraph? Third paragraph of Shema is what? That God is not just, I'm going to use an example. God is not just the, what, what Plato referred to as the watchmaker, or what we all refer to as the person who works for Microsoft, who lives, let's say, in Mercer Island or in Seward Park, somewhere in Seattle. They write or develop a piece of software. They have no relationship with you or I, the end user of that software. Once they've written it, created it, Microsoft sells it, and there's no connection between the, the creator of the software and the user of it. That's not so with the Almighty. God didn't just create this universe. God interacts with this universe. God runs this universe. There's a historical relationship. What we call God is a providential God, a mashkiach ba'olamo. He providentially runs and interacts with the universe that he has created. That is the theme of the third paragraph. Where do you see that? The cl most classic, the most acute example of this is what we call Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim. How God was lakachas lo goy mi of goy, how he extricated a nation from what is referred to as the kur habarzal, from the iron cauldron that no one ever escaped from. God, systematically through the Eser Makos, then through the destruction of the military at Yamsuf, destroyed the Egyptian people, I'm sorry, the Egyptian economy, its gods that it worshipped, its military that was the dominant military on the face of the earth that had state-of-the-art weaponry, all of that was, was destroyed through the Eser Makos and through Yamsuf. That's a classic example. I mean, that's a major classic example of what? Of this principle of providence, of how God historically interacts and relates to the world. So three principles. The basis of the existence of this universe, the basis of our existence and, and who runs this universe, that's the universal principle of the first paragraph. Second paragraph is our unique, distinct parochial relationship to God being Jews and the covenant that we are responsible to, and there are consequences to, towards violating that covenant. That's the second paragraph. The third paragraph is, is that God didn't just create the universe, God didn't just give us a covenant, but God runs the universe, interacts, has a historical drama throughout the millennia with humanity. That's the third paragraph. 
Those are all philosophical statements. Those are all philosophical principles of how we conduct our affairs and how we relate to God. What is that doing as a prelude to the Amida? What is that doing as a prelude to our dialogue, to our tefillah with the Almighty? That's the question. And just to bolster that question, I'm going to prove to you that, that that's the case. First of all, it's, it's obvious when you read the psukim and learn those sections of Devarim and Bamidbar. But the fact that Chazal had to expand each of those paragraphs with a bracha, the two brachos of the first two paragraphs before the Shema and the third bracha after the Shema. You know what? You know, they, they, they used to joke, I, th I don't know if it was Hillel Seidman, but he was a survivor of the Warsaw Ghetto and he would um, write for the Yiddish newspapers in America. So apparently he didn't earn enough in terms of Parnasso just writing for newspapers, so what did he do? He translated William Shakespeare into Yiddish. And they say, in his, he writes on the, on the cover, Shakespeare, I think it was the, the cover th to the effect of Verteicht und verbessert. Shakespeare, translated and enhanced or improved upon. Now, how, you know, it's, it's ludicrous. What, you're you're going to improve and enhance Shakespeare. No, we're, we're not there to read you. We're there to read Shakespeare. So if I could use, ask the question, what were Chazal doing? The, those three paragraphs from the Torah, they don't speak for themselves. Chazal have to develop them, embellish them, improve upon them. Why did Chazal make brachos? I mean, Think of that question. And also, what's the role of Baruch Hu? See, Baruch Hu, you know what Baruch Hu is? Baruch Hu is any time something inherently is not prayer, as in the case of Shema, which is inherently a philosophical declaration, but to put it into the rubric, to give it a kiyum tefillah, to put it into the misgerek, the rubric or the context of prayer, that's what Baruch Hu does. Baruch Hu defines something which is inherently not prayer, it tells us that it's putting it into the context of being Mishabeach HaKadosh Baruch Hu, of praising Hashem. That's what it is. So, it's the same thing as what the brachos do. The brachos are taking these themes and in, in converting these themes into a tefillah, into a praise of God, into a petition of the Almighty. So, why? Why are they doing that? Why are Chazal taking the three themes expanding the themes, turning it from a philosophical statement into a vehicle of praising God and a vehicle of relating and petitioning and asking God. Why? The reason is, because see, my point is, the assumption of this question is correct. The assumption of the question is very fair and very correct. You could have fulfilled this mitzvah of Shema, B'shoch B'chav Kumecha, the time when people go to sleep or when they, at the time when people wake up, what happens? You have an obligation to articulate certain ideas. It's Bach Lokas Rishonim, whether it's the first Pasuk, whether it's the first paragraph, the first two paragraphs, the Rambam, the first three paragraphs, whatever the Shita, the Rashi, Tosfus, the Ramban, Rambam, whichever you hold, you could have just said them. St articulate certain philosophical truths, certain philosophical ideas. Why did Chazal juxtapose that? They juxtaposed it that it has to be the immediate predecessor to the prayer, to the Amida. S what we call in halacha, smichas gula litfila. The immediate juxtaposition. You have to talk about the idea of God as in someone who interacts, who responds historically, who responds to prayer, who providentially you know, interacts with humanity. That has to be the immediate predecessor. Smichas gula litfila, that theme of geula has to be the immediate predecessor to the Amida. Why? So the answer is, the answer is this, and it goes back to what we said throughout our explanation of Psuke de Zimra. In order to make it a more meaningful, a more appropriate, a more, to give one a better context when one has the rendezvous, when one davens, you have to know what God is and what God is not. Who is the Ribbon Sholem? What role does the Ribbon Sholem have vis-a-vis -vis the universe? What is, in, in order that I don't see myself in a, in a self-centered way, that I'm the center of the universe, 
but in a context of, of the Rebona Sha'olam's manifestation, how he runs the universe, it gives one, in one word, perspective. A proper, healthy, appropriate perspective of how to relate to God. Meaning, not to project certain human emotions onto God. You know, he's there to meet my every women fancy. No. Not to have the wrong notions and inappropriate thoughts about the Rebona Shalom. But what? To see myself as a servant of God, as being sustained by God, my responsibilities. It's not all about me, me, me. It's not about narcissism. It's about my responsibilities. What is my machovasi? What, what is my responsibility in this universe? And you do that by developing and understanding these themes as a human being in the first paragraph, as a Jew in the second paragraph. And what's crucial in the third paragraph is to know God does listen to prayer. God is a shomea tefillah. The Abishta hears our tefillahs. The Abishta responds to tefillah. That's crucial. That's what these three themes do. And they get, why do they get embellished? They're not embellished. The, the, no one needs to perfect the word of the divine. No one needs to perfect the word of, of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. But what Chazal are doing is they're taking those themes and, and, and they're, they're utilizing those themes as a tefillah to prepare ourselves for the ultimate, for the, for the tefillah. There's only one thing that's called tefillah. In, in Mishnaic terminology, that's the Amida for that face-to-face -face dialogue. And what we're going to do is, in the next session, we're going to actually look at the text of the brachos, how they expand that.